Good to see you. It's uh, the traditional territory of Lekongan speaking, keep speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, that, uh, whose territory we're on here at the legislature today. I'm happy to uh, have this week's media availability on Tuesday. We have a full day uh, cabinet meeting tomorrow, and I won't be able to fit this in, but it also is an announcement uh, today coming on the heels of what will be uh, one of those photo opportunities that you, you, we've been hoping for for months now, and that will be the delivery of the first vaccine into healthcare workers uh, in the Lower Mainland starting later on this afternoon. I want to acknowledge, firstly, the passage of another 49 British Columbians from COVID-19 over the weekend. These are uh, very, very difficult times for families, uh, particularly for those who are losing loved ones in long-term care facilities. But I want British Columbians to know that we're doing everything that we can to continue to keep uh, these uh, epidemic results under control to the best of our ability. And it depends on the goodwill and the focus of all British Columbians. We have been successful compared to our neighbors. Uh, example, over the past seven days, there have been 7,000 more cases of COVID-19 in Alberta than there have been here in British Columbia. Although the numbers are unacceptably high here in British Columbia, we together have flattened the curve over the past couple of weeks and we're hopeful that if we continue to abide by public health orders over the weeks ahead, getting through the Christmas season, we'll be in a much better position come January when we all turn the page on this uh, tragic year and start focusing on, with hope and optimism on a better future in 2021. But in order to get there, we have to redouble our efforts to ensure that the vaccines can get distributed to as many of us as possible in the early days and to all British Columbians who are prepared to take a vaccination by the time we get to the summer. Dr. Henry and Minister Dix, of course, and uh, Dr. Brown, who's uh, overseeing logistics, will be available to discuss those issues in more detail. And I'm confident that uh, you and the media and the public will be well served by canvassing those issues with them. But in order for us to get there, we need to make sure that those issues that we put in place are being uh, acted upon by British Columbians. The vast majority of our citizens are focusing on keeping themselves well, keeping their families safe, and doing the right thing for their communities. But there are those who are not prepared to bend a little bit in their personal lives to the benefit of all of us collectively. And so consequently, we're going to be beefing up enforcement on public health orders over the next couple of weeks, ensuring that community safety investigators, conservation officers, and others that are doing the work of people of British Columbia, whether it be in, uh, in labor, whether it be in uh, workplace safety, whether it be uh, anywhere where you have an authority over citizens, we're going to ask you to be working with law enforcement to ensure that our public health orders are, are in place and being uh, acted upon. That means holding rule breakers accountable. That means ensuring that the fines that we levy are collected. Certainly everyone has a right to appeal. Everyone has a right to due process. But once that due process has been finalized, if you do not pay the fines, we will send collections after you. This is serious. This is not a lark. This is not something we do lightly. Those who do not want to obey the rules that the rest of us are following will have to pay the consequences. I don't believe you can put a price on public safety, particularly as we come to this very difficult second wave of a global pandemic. So although we are coming to the holiday season, the legislature is sitting and we will wrap up in the next number of days. And as we look to 2021, we need to do so knowing that we are there for each other, knowing that all British Columbians understand and recognize the challenges that we have overcome to get to this point and the hope and optimism that awaits us in 2021, provided we abide by simple rules, which are to keep your distance from other people. Keep your bubbles very, very tight over the holiday season. Do not interact with people you normally don't interact with. And of course, if you're in a public place, wear a mask. These are simple rules. They're rules that have put British Columbia in a good place relative to our neighbors, whether they be to the south in, in Washington or to the east in Alberta and beyond. So please, British Columbians, I want you to have a great holiday season, but I also want you to be safe. And I want you to recognize and understand that your actions can not just uh, save your family members, but they could save other people's family members as well. It's not too much to ask, and if you're not prepared to follow the rules, if you're going to look for loopholes, there'll be consequences for that. 
And with those uh, brief comments, I'm happy to take any questions that the media may have. Reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. Our first question today comes from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Thanks, Premier. Um, so we're going to see the first phase of the vaccine distribution starting later today. Uh, I'm hoping you can share your thoughts on how the next phases should work. So there are a lot of people in that second group who are deemed essential, and I'm wondering how you see this unfolding, the next priorities. Do teachers get in line ahead of grocery clerks? Do seniors in the community come before firefighters? Just walk me through what you'd like to see there. Well, we're taking guidance from a national committee that's been established by public health officers across the country. Uh, they're getting input from uh, every corner of the, pro uh, of the country as well as uh, advice and counsel from international experts. We're digesting all of that national information and Dr. Henry and her team in consultation with uh, Minister Dix and the Ministry of, of Health are looking at the best way to ensure that we can maximize the benefit of the vaccines that are available today and will be available in the weeks ahead. I understand the Moderna vaccine is very close to approval. Uh, it's much easier to work with. Uh, we're very excited to have the Pfizer vaccine arriving today and the first shots being uh, delivered today. Uh, and this isn't to say that one is better than the other. That's just a, a timing question. Uh, the efficacy of both of these uh, first vaccines is very, very high, over 90%. And there are a half a dozen others that are in the pipeline that may well prove to be even more effective and easier to use uh, in a province as vast and diverse as British Columbia. But our priorities will be on the areas where we have community transmission. That means largely in uh, Coastal Health and the Fraser Health Authority, but not exclusively. We're going to, well, with the uh, Pfizer vaccine, focus on health care providers as we get Moderna and other vaccines that are easier to transport and we can use effectively. We'll then move into long-term care facilities and then start moving down the line. With respect to various professions that are so critically important to the uh, well-being and success of uh, our economy and our, and our social fabric, all of those issues will be developed as we have a better understanding of how much vaccines available to British Columbians. Keep in mind that this is a scarce resource at the present time. There are over 7 billion souls on the planet. All of them, I suspect, or a vast majority, reflecting on where they fit in the priorities of getting vaccines uh, into the arms of citizens, whether they be British Columbians, Canadians, North Americans, or citizens of the world. So we're going to have to be patient and uh, rely on the good judgment of those who are making these determinations. Uh, government will obviously grapple with those issues, uh, but I wouldn't want today, uh, with the first shot, to start predicting where and how we will be distributing vaccines in February and March as we see uh, what the scarcity issue is all about, how many vaccines do we have available to us, and how best to distribute those to the greatest number of people. Do you have a follow-up, Justine? Sure, thanks. Um, so last week you met with the First Ministers, and one of the things you were hoping to do is get some certainty around what BC's share of the Moderna vaccine would look like. Were you successful in uh, gaining that edge for BC's uh, Indigenous populations and elderly populations that would be find that more accessible? I think those conversations will be ongoing. Uh, the biggest uh, issue at the conference, quite frankly, was the Canada Health Transfer. This is an issue that requires uh, uh, significant uh, attention from the federal government. It's been that way for a number of years. This is not dropping this at the lap of the current government. Uh, the decline in Canada Health Transfers has been going on for decades. I believe, and my colleagues uh, around the Premier's tables believe, that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rebalance the funding of public health care in the interest of all Canadians. The federal government understands that, uh, but they are focused currently, and, and I, I'm not going to uh, quibble with this or pass judgment on the decisions they're making. They are focusing on the here and the now. The vaccines are key. Uh, distributing those vaccines across the country equitably is key. Uh, I still believe that this is an opportunity for all Canadians to look at our health care system renewed as we go into 2021 with a pan global pandemic, hopefully uh, increasingly in our rearview mirror, to talk about how we fund our public system. Uh, with respect to how we distribute the vaccines, uh, currently it will be on a per capita basis. And I suspect unless there is some uh, significant change in, in uh, community transmission in one province over another, uh, that will be remaining uh, in place. 
Obviously, the challenges in the Northern Territories are significant distance and, and the volatility of Pfizer. So I, I believe when Moderna uh, and others come on stream, they'll be heading straight to the north as they should so that we can ensure that those vulnerable populations are protected. The next question is from Rob Shaw, Vancouver Sun. Hi, uh, Premier. I just wanted to talk about the reduction in the uh, benefits to people on income assistance and uh, and disability assistance. And you made some comments in the legislature yesterday uh, along the lines of one of the reasons that this reduction ends in March is so that the government can get into the budget process and make any increases permanent in the years going forward. So I'm wondering if you could expand on that. Does that mean we're going to see some permanent increase to disability and income assistance in the budget? And is that going to compensate for the some of the reduction that people are complaining about right now? Well, uh, thanks for the question. And, and we all have a lot to do to address poverty in British Columbia. It was a high priority uh, when we campaigned in 2017. We put in place a poverty reduction plan, the first in BC history, the last province to have one. And we've made some progress. Uh, uh, I felt that it was uh, beyond hypocrisy for a, a former government, the BC Liberals, uh, to talk about uh, what we've done with respect to reducing poverty and ensuring that we get more resources into the hands of vulnerable populations. It was a bit rich for them to say that the, the 16 years that they had uh, to do something about poverty led to less of an increase than we were able to provide to uh, people on disabilities and people on income assistance in two and a half years. So that was my indignation. With respect to the past year, uh, with the pandemic, we saw people on income assistance and people with disabilities not being able to access the federal programs, uh, not being able to access uh, the programs that we put in place for British Columbians who had lost their jobs. So we put in place the supplement for uh, first for three months and then for another three months. And as we bring in the COVID benefit for all British Columbians, uh, uh, largely with those below a family income of 125000 people on uh, disability pensions and, and on income assistance will be able to access those dollars. So the net net, as uh, Minister Simons has said, is in fact uh, higher than it would have been had nothing changed. So do we have more work to do? Absolutely. I've made that clear to the Minister of, of Finance and it's the job of the new Minister of Social Development and Poverty Reduction to make the case to Treasury Board and then to the Cabinet as we develop the budget. This is, uh, again, uh, surprising from the leader of the official opposition who spent 16 years at a cabinet table ignoring uh, people with disabilities and vulnerable populations to somehow be giving direction to us as how we're going to deal with this. We need to have a structured process. All governments do it this way. I'm going to be advocating to make sure we're helping the most vulnerable in our populations because I believe that's the right thing to do. Rob, do you have a follow-up? Sure. I'm not entirely sure that answered uh, my question about whether what you were saying is indicating there's a permanent increase. I mean, you said that we're going to get into the budget process and make an, any increases permanent in the years going forward. So I'm just wondering, again, if you could extrapolate that and to add on a couple more questions here, because I know you like it when I do that. Um, is it, I have yet to hear a, a kind of rationale for why this reduction is even being made. And you have mentioned that they come out at a net benefit because of the $1,000 benefit, but nobody else is being required to take a cut in their COVID-related benefits in order to come out ahead in a larger $1,000 benefit. And I'm just wondering if you speak to the fairness of that. There, There is no reduction in any other government programs with the rationale that it's fine because you're going to get access to this other money over here. And why would the lowest-income British Columbians be the ones who have to, who have to face that? Well, firstly, this was a program that we brought in to address COVID uh, that we not only did, we, we renewed it and we've renewed it again, uh, admittedly, at a reduced level. And we've topped that up with the COVID benefit that goes to all British Columbians. Uh, we, we don't anticipate that the COVID uh, pandemic will be with us uh, uh, come the summer uh, of 2021. That's my fervent hope. And that's the expectation, I think, of all British Columbians. So as we build the budget for the coming year, uh, we need to make sure that we're doing that starting from the same level on all programs. 
This is how uh, all governments act. Uh, this is not unique to us. Uh, I did, uh, though, Rob, answer your question that I will be advocating for a permanent increase. Uh, I'm one voice at the cabinet table. The Minister of Finance makes the ultimate decisions on this. That's how our system works. I have complete confidence in Selena Robinson to adjudicate over the very various and sundry requests for funding that will come her way. There are a whole host of initiatives that will help people with disabilities, that will help vulnerable populations. A good example for uh, families would be the Child Opportunity Benefit, which is $133 a month uh, for your first child and an increase on that for your second and third child, not just till age six, which is what the former program was, but to age 18, because we know whether you're uh, a vulnerable population or, or getting by on uh, uh, good family supporting jobs, children cost more the older they get, not less. So we're extending that child benefit, not just to age six, but to age 18. There's a whole host of initiatives that we brought forward to reduce poverty. The, 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 the monthly uh, check for income assistance and for disability pensions is one component of a variety of programs that we put in place to lift people up. And I'm proud of the work we've done so far. I appreciate the uh, official opposition is uh, scrambling for relevance, but uh, uh, unfortunately they've picked a place to start their attack on the government where they have zero credibility. And that's why my, my frustration with the line of questioning from the opposition. Thank goodness we have advocates in the community that are saying loudly and clearly to government, we need to do better. I agree with them and we will do better, subject to our ability to bring forward a whole bunch of initiatives on a range of subjects uh, in the budget process, which is the responsible thing for a government to do. Our next question is from Richard Zisman Global. Uh, Premier, you mentioned in your opening remarks comparing British Columbia to other jurisdictions. When you look at Ontario right now, BC has higher cases uh, per capita. Uh, we have higher hospitalizations by capita. And depending on the time frame you look at, at least in the last few weeks, we have higher per capita deaths than Ontario does. You know, what are we not doing that they are doing? Like, why have we fallen behind here, most importantly, in terms of the number of people in our province who are dying? Well, we've seen an uh, unacceptable increase in fatalities as, as largely as a result of uh, COVID returning to our long-term care institutions. And, and we need to uh, work harder in that area. Minister Dix and Dr. Henry are very focused on that, uh, as am I. And that's why, uh, you know, vulnerable populations in long-term care facilities are not bringing COVID-19 into their care homes. They're, it's coming in through other means. And so we need to inoculate uh, as we get vaccines, those who work in the sector so that we can protect these vulnerable populations. And, and that's, that's the real difference between what's happening in Ontario at the moment and what's happening in British Columbia. Uh, I, I use the Alberta example. I don't mean to be disrespectful to the people in, in Alberta, but they're our immediate neighbor. And the challenges there are significant and their population is far less than ours. Similarly, in Washington State, so I spoke to Governor Inslee last week. Uh, they have been working hard uh, as a state government with virtually no support from their federal government and the consequences are there for all to see. We've been working collaboratively with the federal government on a range of issues that's helped all British Columbians and we'll continue to do that. But I, I believe that the, the current spike we're seeing in cases, again, relative uh, to what's happening now as we see an increase uh, day by day and over the the uh, seven day cycles and the 14 day cycles in other jurisdictions, we've flattened out uh, comfortably uh, in terms of the raw numbers, but the raw numbers are just too high. But they've stayed relatively flat at, you know, between 650 and 700 over those that period. Again, these are numbers that would have knocked us over uh, in March and April, but that regrettably is where the world is at with the second wave. Uh, this is the time when uh, uh, viruses such as this are transmitted. People are going indoors more than they would have in the summer months. So we just need to be vigilant as a, as a community. And that means uh, following the directions of Dr. Henry and her team and doing our best, reminding ourselves every day that our actions will have an impact on other people's lives. Do you have a follow up, Richard? I do on uh, the pandemic pay. And we're learning that there are some here on Vancouver Island who have not yet received pandemic pay after waiting for months and months and months. Is it acceptable that they have still not received the pay that they have worked for and that they are owed? Yeah, no, it's not acceptable. And I'm very frustrated by this. I've expressed that to uh, officials. Uh, I'm advised that there are a variety of reasons for this. Uh, there's lots of uh, 
a blame, if you want to put it in that, those terms, to go around. I'm certainly prepared to accept the par our part uh, as a government for that, but there are institutions out there that have not been moving swiftly enough and are, are quite frankly pointing fingers back at government. We need to stop that. We need to recognize that, uh, that our workforce uh, went above and beyond the call uh, when we didn't know what the future looked like and we need to be compensating them as we all committed to do and I'm going to continue to work as hard as I can to make sure that the province of British Columbia is not the obstacle to ensuring these people get the pay they deserve. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hi, Premier. Just to follow up on what Rob was asking there, um, I know you spoke about advocating for more funds for uh, people with disabilities, um, but families of kids with special needs are also saying that they'd like to see emergency support extended for a year, um, a call that's been put out by the children's rep. And I'm wondering if, you know, you'd be advocating for them and if delaying or pushing back the next budget will also delay their ability to access those funds and what do you say to them knowing that the election you called a year early played a part in that? Well, again, uh, I think that it's easy to uh, to find reasons for uh, a delay in the budget, but the biggest challenge is we don't know, quite frankly, uh, where we're going to be uh, over the next number of months and having additional time to make sure that we get it right, I believe is appropriate. Uh, it, with respect to kids with special needs, I know the new minister, Mitzi Dean, is very seized of this issue. Uh, the Children and Youth Advocate has made it clear uh, where she independently believes that we should be going and we're going to work with uh, advocates and stakeholders and families to make sure that we're doing everything we can to lift them up. Uh, that's our responsibility as a government. Uh, we're committed to doing that. Do you have a follow up, Binder? Yeah, I just want to go back to also another comment that you made that you said that you don't think the pandemic will be with, it, with us uh, Sorry, in the summer 2021. Um, there seem to be a lot of unknowns with regards to the vaccine, you know, how long it lasts, if, you know, this um, virus is mutating. So, I'm just wondering if you can explain what uh, brings forward your confidence in that statement. Well, it's uh, part confidence, part optimism, Bender, quite frankly. Uh, I'm an optimistic guy. We have been through nine extraordinary months. The, the vaccine uh, efficacy is uh, very impressive in trials. Uh, the world, quite frankly, not just British Columbia, but the world is hopeful and optimistic as, as uh, we all should be. Uh, the trajectory of the number of uh, uh, vaccines that we can get to British Columbia over the next number of months puts me in a place of confidence, uh, provided uh, op opinion polls show me that a large number of British Columbians are prepared to get a vaccine, uh, larger than, uh, quite frankly, than other provinces. I'm encouraged by that. And uh, I, I believe that uh, if we continue to practice uh, physical distancing, we continue to take into consideration the changes we've made in our lives uh, uh, to, to protect the people that we care about. If we continue to follow that path and have the benefit of uh, immunizations, I think we'll be in a good place come summer and in a better place next fall. But uh, again, I want to reiterate, uh, Dr. Henry and I are both pretty clear on this. Uh, the vaccine does not mean we throw our masks up in the air today and celebrate the end of COVID-19 because that is not the case. But if we get adequate numbers of uh, vaccines, if we have these not just Moderna, but other companies coming on stream, the scarcity that we see today will hopefully uh, be replaced by abundance. And if there's an abundance of vaccines, that, that means we can get the, the vaccine in the community faster. It'll reduce the ability for the virus to transmit and we'll be in a better place. So that's my optimism. Uh, it's based on uh, briefings from officials who uh, have spent their lifetime uh, working on these issues. And I'm confident that British Columbia has the best uh, advice we can get. And we're going to follow that uh, in the interest of all British Columbians. Our next question is from Lisa Usda, News 1130. Hi, Premier. We've talked about the BC response. You've talked about the BC response financially looking at uh, filling in the gaps from the feds. Where do you see those biggest gaps now? What do you have to fill when you're looking to this next budget and months between them? Well, uh, thank you for that. And uh, where I see, quite frankly, the biggest challenge is uh, public expectations about the delivery of services through our public health care system. And, and that's why myself and other premiers have advocated for, well, as long as I've been going to premiers conferences uh, about making sure that the federal government ups their game and, and reestablishes a partnership in the delivery of health services that will meet the needs of all Canadians and the Prime Minister gets that, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Minister Freeland gets that. 
uh, but I'm not going to, uh, you know, tell uh, them how to run their government. I can certainly ask them, as my colleagues did, uh, to reassess how they look at the Canada Health Transfer. And I hopeful, I'm hopeful that as we get into the new year and the vaccines start to increase and confidence in, in our economic recovery, not just here but across the country, starts to improve, that we'll be in a better position to uh, talk about the infusion of dollars we need to have in our public health care system to address the challenges in long-term care. That means capital spending. Uh, we committed to that during the election campaign and we'll be delivering that over the course of the next four years, modernizing our long-term care facilities so we don't have uh, multiple uh, residents in rooms so that we're trying to reduce and improve the quality of life of British Columbians. That's going to be our focus on the health side and on the uh, uh, social assistance and um, poverty reduction side. I think we've canvassed that fairly well today but uh, it's my view that we are judged as a society on how we uh, work with the most vulnerable among us and that's uh, that's a, a way of life for me, and I'm going to try and instill that in, in the government that I have the, the honour to lead. Those are my priorities, lifting people up, giving them opportunity, and providing the services that British Columbians have come to expect. Uh, we are a, a privileged people to live here with the services that we do have. The job of governments, not just mine, but all governments, is to try and make sure that we're equitably distributing the resources that we have here in BC to meet the needs of all British Columbians. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. We're a couple days away from the end of this first pandemic school term. Wondering how you think it all went. You know, we're seeing a, you know, a few hundred active exposures right now, immense anxiety and frustration from parents. You know, others, you know, happy with us. There's a, a mixed response, but there are multiple exposures. Are you feeling like this went as you thought it would? Are you okay with it? Are you thinking things are going to be okay coming back in January? Well, we're, thank you very much for the question. And it, is, it has been a very challenging area, of course. Uh, so many people depend on our public health care, pardon me, our public education system, kids, parents, uh, uh, teachers, uh, those that support uh, uh, the infrastructure in our schools, janitors, support staff, uh, education assistants, trustees, administrators. We put a lot of energy as communities into our K-12 to system and we've got a lot of learnings over the past number of months that we will amend and adapt. That's part of the plan we had uh, coming into September. It was a flexible plan. It continues to be flexible. We've made improvements as required and we'll continue to make those improvements. I think the key part of this, of course, is we keep talking to each other. I'm very appreciative that all of the stakeholders and they have their grievances. I don't want to uh, diminish uh, anxiety within the, the, the uh, people who work in the system. Not at all but let's learn uh, from what we've seen over the past number of months and let's take that those learnings and make amendments to the plans in schools right across the province uh, speaking to parents directly I absolutely understand the anxiety you know that uh, your kids are best to be in school but you also know that we're in the middle of a global pandemic and that will lead to uncertainty every parent out there I'm a parent I my kids are out of school but I still uh, wring my hands, my spouse and I every day worrying about how they are doing, where they are. One, one son is a teacher and uh, the other is married to a teacher. So on the education side, uh, we're very seized of this. Uh, and so I appreciate how parents feel. And my, my appeal to you is uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure your children are safe, to make sure the people that work with your children are safe. And we're going to keep doing that until we get out from behind COVID-19. Our next question is from Les Lane, Times Colonist. Well, thank you. Premier, I've got a local question. The three electoral areas in the capital all made one request for a change in their designation to uh, give them an advantage in applying for grants from senior governments. And your government, the day before you called the election, you approved it just for the one electoral area in your riding, but not in the other two that are in a green riding. Can you explain that? I know Ravi Kalan, the new minister, is looking at the decision-making process that led to that. I can say that uh, the electoral area in my constituency does not, it's part of the Capital Regional District and was excluded 
from applying for the Port Renfrew is uh, the the issue quite frankly Port Renfrew was excluded from applying for grants uh, because they uh, the residents there are in the capital regional district you can throw a football across the San Juan River and be in the Couch and Valley regional district where people are able to apply for grants so that was the grievance that I had with the plan when it was brought in in 2005 and I spoke to it in the legislature at that time. Uh, the applications that came from uh, these Gulf Islands, who are also part of the Islands Trust and part of the CRD, I, are absolutely as valid, uh, I'm sure, and it's up to the minister to make a determination on how to proceed from here. Do you have a follow up, Les? Yeah, the, um, just on the bill that you're debating right now in the legislature, you um, in the summer legislated permission to delay the budget. Um, the situation now is pretty much the same, the pandemic, et cetera, and you've decided you need still more extra time to deliver a budget, potentially into April or May. Why was this uh, not figured out earlier? Well, it won't be into May. It will be in April. Uh, it's normally in February. It has to be before the end of the fiscal year, normally. But this is not normal times. Uh, we have a new finance minister and uh, we have uh, new initiatives that we're bringing forward. And I'm confident that uh, the people of British Columbia will not lose sleep over when the budget is tabled. And I'm also absolutely confident that uh, the budget will meet the needs of British Columbians uh, wherever they live and whatever they're doing. We have time for one more question today. Tina Lovegreen from CBC. Thank you so much. Um, my question is for a colleague in Ottawa, um, Premier Horgan. Premiers continue to grapple with implementing COVID-19 restrictions. How hard has it been for you deciding to shut down the economy and businesses to stop the spread of COVID-19 with the damage to mental health and even fears of an increase in suicide? Well, uh, we have not seen increases in suicides that I've been briefed on. I, I, I could stand to be corrected, but if it, uh, I haven't seen that. We have seen an unacceptable increase in opioid deaths as a result of COVID-19. That I'm absolutely certain of. And we need to redouble our efforts as a society to address uh, addictions as well as mental health challenges that have been uh, made more complex as a result of COVID-19, more isolation, uh, fear of economic consequences from not being able to work, uh, businesses uh, not being able to meet their costs. So we've been working a, as hard as we can to ensure that we're providing uh, programs for people, for businesses, and for communities. And we've done, I believe, a pretty decent job of it. Uh, of course, we need to make sure that implementation of the policies as in the interest of the people and the businesses and the communities that we're attempting to help. Uh, I, I can't speak to how other jurisdictions have uh, approached these issues. I, I only make reference to our immediate neighbors in terms of the challenges that they face. Uh, we have, uh, between Alberta and British Columbia, economies that depend on each other. We have workers in BC that go to Alberta. We have workers in Alberta that come to BC. Uh, I'm encouraging all British Columbians to stay close to home uh, for as long as they possibly can into the new year. And I would encourage other Canadians to do the same thing. I believe that the way we get control of this nationally is by staying in our communities uh, as best as we can. Obviously, there's going to be essential services that require people to move uh, from where they are to where they need to be over the course of a day or a week or a month. But uh, if you don't have to move, uh, you shouldn't. And I'm really encouraging people. Uh, we've seen uh, outbreaks in, uh, in the interior and in the north uh, as a result of transmission coming from outside of British Columbia. And we need to, we need to work together to stamp that out. So that's, uh, I hope that answers your question. I kind of lost the thread. My apologies for that. You Tina, might want to try it again. Do you have a follow-up, Tina? Yeah, so, so really the question was how hard has it been for you to decide to shut down the economy and businesses? And so maybe I'll just follow up with, you know, how much has this weighed on you? What are you hearing from business owners and others dealing with mental health issues? Okay, uh, well, thank you for the how do you feel question because uh, I feel terrible some days and you know, euphoric others. I'm very excited today that a vaccine has arrived in British Columbia. But every day has been a challenge since uh, February and March when we saw the uh, arrival of COVID-19 and the consequences it's had on people's lives. But we took a different approach. Uh, I remember being in this very room quite frankly, in March, uh, and the cry from the media who were in, at that time were sitting in this room, uh, that this was time to lock down because that's what the, the phrase was, we need to lock down. 
And we took a different approach here uh, to other provinces and some other jurisdictions to a better effect at that time. And that was to try and find ways to keep operating safely. And I give full credit to Dr. Henry and uh, WorkSafe BC who worked collaboratively, public health and uh, workplace rules to make sure that we had, uh, for example, our construction industry was able to continue. We were continue, able to continue building homes for people because we put in place regulations through health and through uh, work safe to make sure that we could continue to operate the economy. And that put us in a pretty good place relative to others. Now, having said that, uh, we have seen exposures not so much in work sites, but uh, brought into work sites, whether they be uh, schools, whether they be construction sites, whether they be uh, other um, ac activities in the economy. So has it weighed heavily on me? Absolutely. But no more so than uh, Minister Dix and Minister H Dr. Henry, when we have to regrettably advise British Columbians, as they have been doing uh, virtually daily since March, uh, about people losing their lives, uh, over 600 uh, heading to 650 British Columbians are no longer with us. And that's the most difficult part of this because they're not just numbers, they're moms and dads, they're brothers and sisters, uh, they're daughters and sons. And, and that, uh, as we think about this time of year when families are coming together, there are going to be families that will not be able to do that because of restrictions, but there are families that will not be able to do that because their loved ones are no longer here. And I hope that those who are anxious and disappointed that they won't be able to gather with family at this holiday season, whether it be for Hanukkah, for Christmas, or just celebrating the change of years, that they will keep in mind that the sacrifices that they're making may keep people alive down the road. And, and be mindful of the 650 families that have lost a loved one since COVID arrived in British Columbia. Thank you, everyone. That's all the time we have.